Hello, I'm Edward Peake. Welcome to Arts Alive, the arts programme here on Bay TV. This week we've got a, a major feature about someone who started off as a graphic illustrator. He coined the phrase 15 minutes of fame and he went on to become the formative artist of the 20th century. Remarkable man. You'll know him from his Campbell's Soup poster, which everyone has seen. He's a remarkable chap, Andy Warhol. Here it is. Andy Warhol was one of the most famous artists of the 20th century. Um, but when we talk about fame with Andy Warhol, it's probably a different sort of fame to the likes of Picasso or Jackson Pollock. Uh, there's a kind of superstardom associated with Andy Warhol. Um, in the 1980s, Andy Warhol appeared on an episode of The Love Boat, which was a very cheesy American sitcom. Uh, if any other artist had appeared on The Love Boat in the 1980s, uh, we wouldn't have recognised him, but my mum and dad would have recognised Andy Warhol. By the 1980s, he was as famous as, as Charlie Chaplin or Mickey Mouse, so he's a very recognisable figure. There's a reason for this fame. The reason why he becomes so famous is partly because fame is a subject in his art, celebrity is a subject in his art, but also I think um, he becomes so famous because he believes that art should be for everybody. His art reaches out beyond the gallery. We probably all have some idea of the Andy Warhol aesthetic without even visiting this exhibition. The great luxury about this exhibition, of course, is we can see his ideas in the gallery, but also consider how his ideas go beyond the gallery and into our lives and into society. Well, he starts off as a commercial artist in the 1950s, and his commercial art is very hand-drawn. It looks very kind of like inky and expressive and gestural with the hand of the artist. But it also looks very printed as well, because that's he, he developed a style called the blotted line printing technique, which means you draw with very runny ink and then you can print onto another piece of paper. So the idea of repetition was there very early in his work, and the idea of um, uh, a, a range of images that were ready to be used one way or another. So he was working for uh, well, Harper's Bazaar, he was working for Vogue magazine, he was working for the I. Miller Shoe Company, and very quickly he became a very successful uh, commercial artist. Uh, but he always harbored ambitions to be a proper artist, as it were, an artist with a capital A. Uh, like his favourite artists at the time would have been Robert Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns, so he wanted to be an artist like those. Uh, and eventually what he does, he eventually realises that he doesn't need a drip or a splash in a painting. If you look at Jackson Pollock paintings of the 1950s, if you look at a lot of American art in the 1950s, especially in New York, it was full of drips and splashes and artists expressing themselves. Andy's philosophy, eventually he develops a philosophy that is the complete opposite to that. He develops uh, a style of repetition. His studio becomes the factory. By calling your studio the factory, that is the complete opposite philosophy to Jackson Pollock expressing himself. Also, the idea of collaboration, uh, that art can be made by lots and lots of people. Um, it's, a, it's a weird thing with Andy Warhol, actually, is that sometimes you... Uh, you might think that lots and lots of people make Andy Warhol's work, but you can still tell an Andy Warhol when you see one. So there was an overarching sort of aesthetic to his work. Um, the interesting thing about this exhibition is, though, that he continues to be a commercial artist. We often think there's a difference between his 1950s commercial artist career and his later career as a pop artist in the 60s onwards, right through to the 80s. But he always returns to record covers. He always returns to magazines. He always returns to... Uh, book covers and book illustrations and broadcasting and TV. So his art, as well as existing in the gallery like it does here, it makes its way into shops still, even when he's the famous pop artist, it still makes its way into our homes, for example. If you've got the Velvet Underground album cover with the banana on the front, as many people do, then, uh, then you have an Andy Warhol in your home as well as existing in the gallery. So I think that was the overriding philosophy of Andy Warhol. Not only did he believe that art should be for everyone, he also believed that everyone could be an artist. He was quite interested in getting rid of the idea of the authorial genius, you know, this I'm the, I'm the lone person with this genius. No, 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 we can have lots of people doing this, you can help me. I'm going home now, can you keep making my art for me? So the idea of other people um, making his art, helping him with his art, and the art going out there into lots and lots of different places. It kind of takes the preciousness out of art. Having said that, it still makes art 
exciting. It still makes people, when they walk through the door, they still feel a certain joy and a certain sort of elation when they see his art. So there is still something special about his art, even though he's kind of ridding it of its gene, all these ideas of genius and all these ideas of the poetic idea of an artist. He gets rid of all those sorts of ideas. Well, you can see here with these record covers here, um, there you can see that uh, um, he starts off as this hand-drawn artist where he's with this blotted ink style. Uh, and as you, as you go into the 60s with the pop art kind of Andy Warhol, he's still doing that. He's still making record covers. Um, the reason we've selected a lot of the earlier stuff that might be lesser known is to show this contrast, really. It, I, I, we keep talking about it like it's a contrast, but it's not a contrast because he keeps doing it later. In, but it looks very different. The earlier work looks very different to the later work. But you can see that this later Andy Warhol style that we all know and recognize gets applied to the commercial world of graphic design. What we're trying to show as well is that there's a blur between what we might think of as graphic design and fine art. And there's also a blur between what we might think of as high culture and popular culture. It all becomes blurred. Um, also, a blur between what you might think of as seriousness and playfulness as well. There's a lot of fun, but you can also be quite serious about Andy Warhol. Um, it's interesting that the early, young Andy Warhol, as well as studying art, pictorial design, and the history of art, he also studied psychology and sociology as well. Uh, so I think he was a very... I don't think any other artist in the 20th century was quite aware, or quite as aware of the society around them. Um, looking at the images around them and making them... and bringing them into his art, as we're trying to show here, but then also his art then goes back out into society. So he looks at society, brings it into his art, then it spills out in an Andy Warhol way. Marilyn Monroe is famous. She then becomes a subject for Andy Warhol, and then, um, and then she becomes famous as, a, as an Andy Warhol. There are lots of young people who come into the gallery who think of Marilyn Monroe more as an Andy Warhol thing than a movie star thing. When I was young, we saw Marilyn Monroe films on a Sunday afternoon, and then I saw Randy Warhol's depiction of Marilyn Monroe. A lot of young people know, them, know Warhol's Marilyn more than they know Marilyn, as it were. Very early on, he said that he was going to give up art, which he doesn't do, but he said in the 1960s, oh, I'm going to give up art and make films. Um, but he, he keeps returning to art, and he often says that I'm going to give up art, but he keeps returning to art. Um, and his films start off as art house films, if you like. They start off as things that you might see in a gallery. For example, there's a film of the Empire State Building being shot for about... It's a film that lasts eight hours. I don't know anyone who sat down and watched this film for eight hours. Um, but it might be an interesting thing to have in a gallery. Is it a still picture of the Empire State Building? Is it a moving picture? So to have a moving image of something that doesn't move kind of raises up raises all kinds of philosophical questions about pictures and movies and everything. So it's still a kind of art project in a way when he starts to make films. But he wants to make it into more mainstream filming. He wants to make um, proper films, as it were. Because uh, a lot of the critics tend to not like... A lot of film critics tend to not like Andy Warhol's films. A lot of art critics might like his films because they kind of make an artistic statement. When he wants to move out beyond the art world and make proper films, if you were to put the Empire State film on TV, for example, people wouldn't watch it because, you know, when you, you turn over, you, you change channel. It's so fatally easy to change channel. So later he starts to develop proper TV skills, if you like, and as a production company, the old Han Andy Warhol, the whole Andy Warhol thing becomes a business eventually. That can include art, it can include TV, it, it can include film. And eventually he has Andy Warhol's TV on, M on MTV, it's it, quite, which is quite interesting. You probably wouldn't have MTV without Andy Warhol. Um, the whole idea of music and visuals coming together kind of is part of his Andy Warhol's aesthetic as well, which kind of gives us the idea of MTV and things like that and pop videos and everything else later. And on MTV, he has his own channel where he interviews various uh, famous people, celebrities, important people. Uh, and again, it's not very edited. It's not very, a bit like his early films, it's very kind of just the camera on the person's face being interviewed. But I think he, um, he certainly had ambitions to kind of, my ideas should somehow make it into people's homes, should somehow be on TV as well as in the gallery. Uh, and I think he felt, um, I think he questioned the whole kind of, avant-garde scene, which he was certainly part of in New York. He was certainly part of this New York avant-garde sort of scene. Uh, and he even kind of helps create that to some degree in the 60s. But I think he wants to go further than that. He wants his reach to go, go beyond. Um, to, you know, it's like a band. It's like the Velvet Underground. The Velvet Underground were kind of a, an avant-garde sort of scene in the 60s, but 
Lou Reed eventually becomes a famous rock star working with David Bowie and the like and you know we get Mick Jagger visiting the studio later so it becomes a very out there big celebrity thing as well as a kind of avant-garde scene as well so I think he always had that ambition to to do something that would reach a lot of people that would reach loads and loads of people and the best way in that day and age was TV in this day and age in an age of the iPhone in the age of Twitter in the age of uh, multi, uh, you know kind of lots of multimedia things around us it kind of prefigures that you know there's the selfie there's a bridge between the self-portrait and the selfie as it were is it an artwork a self-portrait well yes it is but some of the pictures that he takes of himself to make those self-portraits are almost like early selfies they're almost kind of so he, again there's this bridge between what we might think of as fine art and the media he wanted to engage with the media he wasn't critical of the media as some people might think he is sometimes people think he's satirizing our age our media age but he was kind of part of it actually he wanted to engage with the media um, Gretchen Bender um, who we also have here at the Tate she kind of has a critique of the media if you will she uses video to make a critique of the video age that we live in or the media age that we live in whereas Andy Warhol wanted to engage with the media. Andy Warhol, remarkable chap, he was a pioneer in the use of computer generated art, something we take for granted. Join us after the break when we see more of his work and hear more about the man behind the art. Welcome back to Arts Alive. Film, photography, music, painting, sculpture, all the things that Andy Warhol was so good at. We're going back now to see even more about the art and the man. Looking forward to seeing this. Here we are by the, camp, the famous Campbell Soup Tins. Uh, the Campbell Soup Tins come out of a desire in Andy to do something different to what was happening before in art. First of all, art was very expressive, paint was being splashed all over the place. Um, there's nothing overtly painterly about the soup tins at all. They look like they've been mechanically reproduced, which indeed they have, because he's discovered the silkscreen printing process in 1962. These are later versions that he returns to in 1968. Um, and also the subject of the soup tin is an interesting one because it, what Andy Warhol picks up on are subjects that might be deemed unsuitable for art. The earlier art is meant to be grand and, and you know, poetic. Uh, this is mundane and ordinary. This isn't worthy of the, sub, the, the subject of art. So I think there's uh, two things going on. It's getting rid of the hand of the artist, splashing the paint around everywhere. But also I think there's a desire to, to focus on things that we might overlook in art, but really, we don't overlook them in life. So he picks up uh, the way they're presented as well, the same way they might be presented on supermarket shelves as well. It's funny, isn't it? We accept the still life of a, a bowl of fruit and a bottle of wine, that's fine, but we don't want a tin of soup. Well, Andy Warhol says, well, why? Why is a tin of soup unacceptable, but a bowl of fruit is perfectly acceptable as a work of art? It came out of a desire originally. Um, to, um, it was a woman, um, Muriel Latto, who was a... Uh, uh, an interior designer and he said to her I need an idea to make a work of art something that's different to Robert Rauschenberg Jasper Johns these artists that he already likes and she says well why don't you paint something that we see every day why don't you just paint like a tin of soup for example as a kind of offhand throwaway remark and he just says oh wow yeah a tin of soup he also says that he eats the soup all the time as well repeatedly he eats it every day I'm sure he just said that to kind of as a little way of kind of promoting his art but also promoting the Campbells as well, I suppose. But, um, but I think um, but the idea of repeatedly eating it and opening a tin every day is kind of, again, part of the, the only thing that's different, of course, about each of these tins is the flavor. So if you look at them, they all look the same except for each flavor. So they're almost like a family portrait. Each one of them belongs to the same family, but each one of them is, is different in its own little way as well. So some people see it as a still life, but I think he brings back still life and portraiture to art. Art throughout the 20th century is becoming more and more abstract, whereas pop art brings back um, subject matter. It brings back the things we worship. People used to always paint kings and queens, lords and ladies, princes and princesses, gods and goddesses. Well, Andy brings, brings us to celebrity. We worship celebrity. We worship consumerism in the 20th century. So in a way, he's a traditional artist in that way. Well, the other big subject uh, in Andy Warhol is celebrity and fame. And you can't get much more famous than Marilyn Monroe here. 
The interesting thing, though, about fame is if you want to be famous, your image needs to be repeated. So this idea of repeating things is quite meaningful in some ways, actually. Uh, your image needs to be repeated and repeated and repeated on front of uh, TV screens, on, on the front of newspapers and magazines and the like. Uh, Marilyn Monroe also died, though, in 1962, so this was done shortly after she died. So she fades away in this painting as you go to the right there. It's also interesting that um, Marilyn is kind of colourful in this section here, but black and white in this other section as she fades away there. And there would have been a lot of colourful, yet black and white imagery going on in the, t the infancy of TV and also in movies as well. What should we use colour or should we use black and white? Uh, so Marilyn can be seen in black and white in colour lots and lots of times as well. Um, it's also a diptych. Now, when we talk about diptychs, we talk about two panels, or triptychs often we say with three panels, and often we associate that with religious art. Um, I think Andy was quite aware that um, by doing it as a diptych, that he was turning Marilyn into some kind of goddess, that she's eternally kind of youthful and beautiful. The fact that she died in 1962 means that she, um, we will never see Marilyn as old. She is forever beautiful and youthful. Uh, James Dean, it was it, who said that live fast, die young and have a beautiful corpse, which I used to always think was really cool when I was young, but now I'm 48, it sounds a little bit more shallow. But I think uh, the other thing about this piece is the, is the hand of the artist as well. We were talking about before that sometimes it's a, there's an interesting mixture of the hand of the artist in Andy Warhol's work and other times where he doesn't use the hand of the artist. So this silkscreen process, any smudges or drips in this black and white section isn't the artist expressing himself, it's part of the mechanical process of producing the work. The unedited, um, mechanically produced art becomes part of Andy's aesthetic for the rest of his career. This is also where he begins to develop the, the factory philosophy of art. Later in 1964, he takes over a, an old factory. And when he takes over this old factory, um, he calls his studio the factory. But also you can see here that to remake anything that's repeated, it needs to be, um, there needs to be a factory process in how we make the artwork, which again is different to earlier art. Um, the interesting thing about this image, it was taken from a publicity shot of Marilyn for the film Niagara uh, with Robert Mitchum. So if you ever see that, you'll see, if you ever see that film, uh, Marilyn's actually got long hair and she's got hair extensions as well. So it's more of a publicity shot rather than, a, people often think it's a still from the movie, which it isn't, it's more of a publicity shot for the movie. Um, and the, that original photograph is quite a long photograph and we see her with her dress and her cleavage and her kind of the Marilyn figure. Uh, but it, interestingly, it's honed right into her face. I often say to young people about Andy Warhol, if you think of Andy as a DJ, as a visual DJ, if you think of a DJ as someone who samples things that already exist, music that already exists, and he can make something new out of those little bits of music, uh, with Andy, um, he's looking at things that, that already exist, images that already exist, and then he samples them and makes something new out of them and makes them into a kind of, uh, makes them into his own artwork. So he didn't take the photograph of Marilyn Monroe, of course. He didn't, um, he didn't design the soup tin. He didn't design the Brillo boxes either. Um, it was, it was taking something else that already exists and turning it into an Andy, War Andy Warhol piece. Uh, by 1964, Andy moves his whole place of operation from an old kind of firehouse and he moves to a, a factory, an unused factory, an old factory, and he calls his studio the factory. Uh, the factory not only becomes uh, a place to produce art, it also becomes a place to hang out. So we get a lot of characters, um, especially when we get to the Velvet Underground years later on, we get a lot of characters in what's called the Silver Factory. It's called the Silver Factory because a guy called Billy Name paints the walls silver. And Billy Name and another guy, Gerald Malinger, end up being uh, quite uh, instrumental in this piece here. So the idea of collaboration and people working together and also a factory process. Originally, he sends someone out called Nathan Gluck. Uh, Nathan Gluck is an assistant of Andy Warhol. He says, get me some boxes. Nathan Gluck comes back with these boxes that are very elegantly designed. And Andy Warhol says, no, I don't want these elegantly designed, kind of pre-Raphaelite looking boxes. I want something a bit more mundane, you know, like the soup tins. Uh, so Gerald Ballinger comes back with boxes like this, and also Heinz boxes, cornflake boxes. And instead of showing the original boxes, you might think this is a kind of Duchampian thing of showing an object that you found in a gallery. But in fact, what they've done is they've actually made these boxes. Uh, they're wooden boxes. And then what they've done is they've painted them white. So one of them, one person would be painting them white. Another person would be getting the original boxes uh, and flattening them out. 
and stenciling them, so cutting out a stencil from the original boxes. And then they would screen print on the side of these boxes. And originally there would have been tons and tons of these boxes filling the gallery space. So it was again it's this factory um, philosophy, this factory method of making the artwork, and also a mundane object. Interestingly, they originally, the original boxes were designed by a man called James Harvey. Uh, and he was an abstract expressionist artist who wasn't selling a lot of paintings. So his day job was designing things like this, and he designed the Brillo box originally. So he designed this not thinking that it was art at all. His art lay elsewhere, but I'll do this as a day job. And he was completely bowled over by the fact that he walked into a gallery one day, and there's all these boxes presented as art, something that he wouldn't have considered to be art, and it was his idea. So we get into all kinds of copyright issues with Andy Warhol, which is interesting. But again, it's... Uh, it's in some ways a, tradi a traditional artwork because it's a sculpture that looks exactly like the thing it's depicting, just as a statue of a man looks exactly like the, the subject it's depicting. So it can be as new or as progressive as you want, but it can be as traditional as you like. We're bringing in portraiture, still life, and sculpture. It, we're getting rid of abstraction in a way and getting back to representing the world around us. So Andy Warhol, remarkable man, but very controversial, especially at the time he was working. He still is now, but of course he's paved the way for so much of what we know as modern art. Pop art was his invention, and other people have taken it on. Well, that's the last programme before the break. Very much looking forward to seeing you all again in the new year. We've had some fantastic features up to now. The Dada Fest exhibition, Robert Heineken photographs, lots of things. Anyway, very much looking forward to seeing you when we come back. Bye for now.